This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year 2011 along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2011. We look back at this year's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony, plus our Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Canadian Music Hall of Fame in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 2011. It was the year that Steven Tyler joined American Idol as a judge, Simon Cowell brought his X Factor TV show to America, and everyone from Christina Aguilera to American Idol singers forgot the words to the national anthem at major sporting events. J-Lo and Mark Anthony broke up. U2 had the biggest grossing concert tour of all time with $736 million made. That lasted until Ed Sheeran broke the record a decade later. Lady Gaga became the first person to sell over 1 million downloads in the first week when her album, Born This Way, came out. Amazon Music priced it at 99 cents, which helped that download total quite a lot. A windstorm made a stage collapse at the Indiana State Fair moments before the band Sugarland was supposed to be on. Michael Jackson's doctor, Conrad Murray, was found guilty of manslaughter in the singer's death in 2009. 17-year-old Justin Bieber was sued by a woman who claimed that he was her baby's father. Bieber won the lawsuit. 2011 was the year of Adele, as her album 21 was the biggest selling album of the year. Other big selling albums included Lady Gaga's Born This Way, Lil Wayne's The Carter Four, Jason Aldean's My Kind of Party, Mumford and Sons' Sigh No More, Drake's Take Care, Frank Ocean's Nostalgia Ultra, Jay-Z and Kanye West's Watch the Throne, and Lady A's Own the Night. Two Christmas albums round out the top ten, Michael Bublé's Christmas and Justin Bieber's Under the Mistletoe. Adele's Rolling in the Deep was the biggest song of the year. Katy Perry hit number one in 2011 with Fireworks, E.T., and Last Friday Night. Coupled with two other songs in 2010 that went to the top of the charts, Katy Perry became the first female artist to have five number one singles from one album. Michael Jackson was the first artist overall to do it with the album Bad back in the 80s. Other big hits included LMFAO with Party Rock Anthem, Pitbull, Neo, and Afrojack with Give Me Everything, Bruno Mars with Grenade and also Just The Way You Are, CeeLo Green with Forget You, which was actually called F.U., and you can figure out what the F actually stood for. Nicki Minaj with Super Bass, Maroon 5, and Christina Aguilera with Moves Like Jagger, and the Black Eyed Peas with Just Can't Get Enough. However, the biggest viral hit of the year was 14-year-old singer Rebecca Black's earworm of a song, Friday. Who can forget that one? In country music, Brad Paisley had one of the biggest selling and most critically acclaimed albums of the year with This Is Country Music. Other big albums were by Eric Church, Luke Bryan, Miranda Lambert, Pistol Annie's, Blake Shelton, Hunter Hayes, Justin Moore, Jake Owen, Lady A, Emmylou Harris, Chris Young, and Sonny Sweeney. On the singles front, Blake Shelton had the top two singles, while Lady A had two of the top 15 songs, and the Zac Brown Band had three songs in the top 15. Other big singles artists for country music were Jason Aldean, Tim McGraw, Kenny Chesney, Luke Bryan, Rodney Atkins, Jake Owen, Sarah Evans, and Miranda Lambert. In hip-hop, Jay-Z and Kanye West's Watch the Throne was one of the biggest-selling hip-hop albums of the year. Other big albums were released by Lil Wayne, Drake, Young Jeezy, J. Cole, Lupe Fiasco, Wiz Khalifa, Bad Meets Evil, Whale, and Mac Miller. 
Singles-wise, Wiz Khalifa's Black and Yellow was the biggest selling single of the year. Other big hip-hop singles were by Lil Wayne, Nicki Minaj, Dr. Dre, Bad Meets Evil, Chris Brown, B.O.B., DJ Khaled, Jay-Z and Kanye West, and Flo Rida. The hip-hop collective Odd Future burst onto the scene in 2011 with Tyler the Creator, Earl Sweatshirt, and Left Brain. 2011 was the year that legit, quote-unquote, EDM artists dominated the dance charts. Sure, you still had Jennifer Lopez, LMFMO, Flo Rida, and Pitbull in there, but you also had classic EDM tracks that are still considered some of the best songs of the past decade. For instance, Avicii's Levels is considered the greatest EDM track ever released by a lot of EDM fans, and that one was huge in 2011. There was also David Guetta and Sia's classic stadium anthem, Titanium. Rihanna got with Calvin Harris and produced We Found Love, which still rocks the festival grounds. The dubstep revolution kicked into high gear with groups like Nervo getting big, along with Skrillex's Bangarang EP. Swedish House Mafia had saved the world, and then they got together with Knife Party to pull out Antidote. Mumbaton became a thing in 2011 as well. DJ Fresh's drum and bass classic Lauda hit number one on the charts as well that year. Other artists who were hot in 2011 included Nicky Romero, Nadia Ali, Benny Benazi, Katie B, Chase and Status, Laidback Luke and Steve Aoki, and K-pop dance group 2NE1, long before there was such a thing as Blackpink or BTS. EDM became such a big thing that the huge Las Vegas club started booking EDM DJs and producers to play there, starting a whole new era in Vegas partying. The top 10 DJs of the year, according to DJ Magazine, were David Guetta, Armin Van Buren, Tiesto, Dead Mouse, Above and Beyond, Avicii, Afrojack, Dash Berlin, Marcus Schultz, and Swedish House Mafia. In Latin music, the big artists of the year included Prince Royce, who had a huge year with the best-selling self-titled album and best-selling single Corazon Sin Cara. Also, Christian Castro, Mana, Shakira, Enrique Iglesias, Wizen and Yandel, Camila, Ricky Martin, Don Omar, and Los Bucas. Musicals that opened on Broadway that year, including revivals of musicals, included Godspell, Anything Goes, An Evening with Patti LuPone and Mandy Patinkin, Baby It's You, Hair, Follies, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, Hugh Jackman, Back on Broadway, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, The Musical, Sister Act, The Musical, The Book of Mormon, and Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, which held the distinction of being the musical people went to in order to see if anyone was going to get hurt at it, as multiple performers had injuries from doing the stunts in the show. Musical films that came out in 2011 included a reboot of Footloose, Glee, the 3D concert movie, The Muppets, Alvin and the Chipmunks, Chipwrecked, Country Strong, and the animated movies A Monster in Paris, Happy Feet 2, Electric Boogaloo, not really, just Happy Feet 2. Rio, Winnie the Pooh, and Phineas and Ferb Across the Second Dimension. Bands that formed in 2011 included Adrenaline Mob, Art of Anarchy, Banks and Steel's Big Talk, Chris Robinson Brotherhood, Crosses, Deep Valley, Dive, Downtown Boys, Five Seconds of Summer, and Pentatonix. Bands that disbanded before, of course, their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus included LCD Sound System, Nick Jonas and the Administration, the Jonas Brothers, the Black Eyed Peas, Disturbed, Good Charlotte, R.E.M., Sonic Youth, Velvet Revolver, She Daisy, and the White Stripes. Bands that got back together in 2011 included Ben Folds 5, Blink-182, Evanescence, Gym Class Heroes, O-Town, and System of a Down. 
A lot of artists passed away in 2011. They included singers Amy Winehouse, Jerry Rafferty, Margaret Whiting, Andrew Gold, James O'Gwyn, Gladys Horton of the Marvelettes, Don Rondo, Joe Arroyo, Ray Herr, and John Larson of the Ides of March, Fasundo Cabral, Bo Dollar, St. Clair Lee of the Hughes Corporation, Lolita Holloway, Ken Archipowski of Randy and the Rainbows, Rosetta Johnson, Gil Scott Heron, Benny Spellman, Janie Lane of Warrant, Fred Farron of the Arbors, Kay Arman, Andrea True, Ronald Mosley of Ruby and the Romantics, Bob Flanagan of the Four Freshmen, Solvi Wang, Cesaria Evora, and Polystyrene of X Ray Specs, folk singer Bort Eric Thorinson. Opera singer Cornell McNeil, record producers Bobby Robinson, Don Kirshner, and Sugar Hill record executive who was behind hip-hop's first big hit, Rapper's Delight, Sylvia Robinson. Also, singer-songwriters Debbie Friedman, Bobby Poe, Charlie Levin of the Levin Brothers, Marvin Cease, Jean Dinning of the Dinning Sisters, Phoebe Snow, Robert Grill of the Grassroots, Jean McDaniels, Dan Peak of America, Coco Robichaux, Dobie Gray, Sean Bonnewell of the Music Machine, Hilda Heltberg, and Vesta Williams, entertainers Georgia Carroll and Betty Garrett, composers Tony Geis, John Barry, Russell Garcia, John Strauss, Eddie Brandt, Peter Lieberson, Milton Babbitt, trumpet player Barry Lee Hall Jr., country music singers Doc Williams, Ferlin Husky, Mel McDaniel, Jack Barlow, Billy Grammer, Johnny Country Mathis of Jimmy and Johnny, and Billy Joe Spears, along with violinist Emmanuel Vardy, drummers Eddie Serrato of Question Mark and the Mysterians, Rick Koontz of The Grassroots, Frankie Toller of the Allman Brothers Band, Don Wood of the Gants, Scott Columbus, and Eddie Marshall, conductor Blanche Honiger, Moise, musicians Dave Shapiro, Eddie Kirkland, Jimmy Norman, Bob Burnett of the Highwaymen, percussionist Ralph McDonald, Evid Solas, and Gary Moore, Jazz bassist Charles Fambro, bassist Mark Tulin of the Electric Prunes, Mike Starr of Alice in Chains, Gerard Smith of TV on the Radio, Mikey Welsh of Weezer, and Harold Johnson, rappers Nate Dogg and Heavy D, songwriters Eddie Snyder, Hugh Martin, and Jerry Lieber, big band leaders Henry Jerome and Oren Tucker, guitarist Tom King of the Outsiders, Paul Moutien and Bill Tapia, organist Odell Brown, cellist Bernard Greenhouse, saxophonist Clarence Clemens of Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, and Frank Foster, jazz pianist Ray Bryant, pianist Pine Top Perkins, Roger Williams, Johnny Radicano, George Shearing, and Aline Nagard Renas, Keyboardist Joel DiGregorio of the Charlie Daniels Band, Dag Stoke of TNT, and DJ and host of the British TV music show Top of the Pops, and also accused pedophile Jimmy Seville. Of course, let us also not forget the death of Apple CEO and visionary Steve Jobs, the man who helped to spearhead three pieces of technology that forever changed music for better or for worse, depending on how you look at it the iPod, the iPhone, and iTunes. In award ceremonies for the music of 2011, Adele took the awards for Best Album for 21 and Song and Record of the Year for Rolling in the Deep at the Grammy Awards. The Best New Artist Grammy winner was a shocker as jazz artist Esperanza Spaulding took home Best New Artist over Justin Bieber, Drake, Florence and the Machine, and Mumford and Sons all of whom, including Esperanza, had really good careers. Still going, by the way. Adele and Taylor Swift won the most awards at the American Music Awards with Taylor winning Artist of the Year. Lady Gaga won Video of the Year at the MTV Video Music Awards for the song Born This Way. 
that was also the ceremony where Beyonce announced her pregnancy by showing her baby bump during her performance. Adele won Artist of the Year at the Billboard Music Awards. Chris Brown won Album of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards. Lady Gaga's Born This Way won Favorite Album. And Katy Perry and Kanye's song E.T. won Favorite Song at the People's Choice Awards. Taylor Swift won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, while Luke Bryan won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Adele also won Best British Album for 21, but One Direction won Best Song for What Makes You Beautiful at the Brit Awards. Michael Bublé's Christmas won Best Album at the Juno Awards. Boy and Bear won Album of the Year for Moonfire, and Got Ye and Kimbra won Song of the Year for Somebody That I Used to Know at the Aria Music Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held in Dusseldorf, Germany that year, Eli and Nikki from Azerbaijan won for the song Running Scared. At the Tony Awards, the Book of Mormon won Best Musical and Anything Goes won Best Revival of a Musical. Musically, at the Academy Awards, Man or Muppet from the movie The Muppets won Best Original Song, while The Artist won Best Original Film Score, adding to The Artist's wins that night as the movie won five awards, including Best Picture. The Pulitzer Prize was won by Zhao Long's opera Madame Whitesnake. P.J. Harvey won the Mercury Music Prize, becoming the first artist to win the award twice, having first won it back in 2001. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on March 4, 2011 at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. At the ceremony, the hall inducted Leon Russell into a new category called the Award for Musical Excellence. That category replaced the Sidemen category and, quote, honors those musicians, producers, and others who have spent their careers out of the spotlight working with major artists on various parts of their recording and live careers, end quote. Electra Records founder Jack Holzman and record producer Art Roop were inducted into the non-performers category. And in the performers category, the hall inducted Darlene Love, Neil Diamond, Dr. John, Tom Waits, and this next group. The person Alice Cooper and the band Alice Cooper have made 28 studio albums so far, 11 live albums, and 21 compilation albums. They've also been nominated for two Grammy Awards and have sold over 50 million records to date. Now, you may be a little confused as to why I said the person Alice Cooper and the band Alice Cooper. Well, that's because, much like Marilyn Manson and Charday. The band took their name from their lead singer, or in this case, the other way around. The man, Alice Cooper, was born Vincent Damon Fernier on February 4, 1948, in Detroit, Michigan. His family moved to Phoenix, Arizona when he was in middle school. He started out in high school playing in a talent show with his track and field cross-country running teammates Glenn Buxton, Dennis Dunaway, John Tatum, and John Spear as the group called the Earwigs, playing Beatles parody songs. After a while, they decided to get serious about being a real band, so they named their rock group The Spiders and started playing different gigs in the Phoenix, Arizona club scene, even though they were still in high school. Once they were out of high school, John Tatum left the group, so he was replaced by Michael Bruce. The band started to venture out to Los Angeles to start playing gigs, and during this point, they called themselves Naz, with two Zs at the end. John Spear also left the band at this time and was replaced by Neil Smith. It's this lineup with Fernier, Buxton, Bruce, Dunaway, and Smith that stayed together until the band's initial breakup in 1974, and this is the lineup that's inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The year after they started calling themselves Naz, they found out that Todd Rundgren already had a band with the same name, so the guys needed to come up with a new name. 
The urban myth is that the band came up with the name Alice Cooper from playing around with a Ouija board. As Vincent said in an interview once, the band actually just came up with a gimmicky name that was sweet and wholesome to contrast it with their hard shock rock image, and thus Alice Cooper the band was born. Another rumor was that they took the name from the character Alice on the TV show Mayberry RFD. However, people started calling Vincent Alice Cooper, and it got to the point where so many people called him Alice that he decided to legally change his name from Vincent Fernier to Alice Cooper after the band's initial breakup, that is. It also helped him to not have any legal issues with using the name when he started his solo career. Another urban myth should probably be dispelled as well. During the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival concert in 1969, for one reason or another, chickens got loose at the venue and one of those chickens got up on stage. Alice took the chicken and tossed it into the air because he thought that chickens could fly because chickens have wings. For the record, chickens can't fly which Alice found out when the chicken dropped into the front section that was the wheelchair section and the poor chicken was ripped to shreds. That's the reality of what happened. What did the fake news media report? Well, that Alice had ripped the head off the chicken and drank its blood. Classy. He was later told to not deny the story because it fit his image. Plus, it made for a much better story than the truth anyway, so there you go. Much like life itself these days. It was during the making of the first album that Alice began to hone his stage act. His act combined vaudeville with a horror aspect, which made him a true pioneer in stage presence. As time went on and as more money was made available to him for his shows, he shocked his audience by having snakes, swords, guillotines, and electric chairs as part of his act. In fact, he is known as the godfather of shock rock. In 1968, music manager Shep Gordon approached the band after watching them play a gig in Los Angeles, at which the audience hated them so much that most of them left in the first 10 minutes. While the band thought that they had played a bad gig, Gordon thought that the Shock Rock Act could work to the band's benefit. He got them in touch with Frank Zappa, who was starting a record label at that time. Frank told them to come by his place at 7 o'clock for an audition. The band thought that he meant 7 in the morning and accidentally woke Frank up, which you never do to a musician because they are notorious night owls. Frank was so impressed that the band was willing to play shock rock music at 7 o'clock in the morning that he signed them to a three-record deal. The first two albums did okay, but not great, but they were mainly psychedelic rock. The band decided to go back to the Midwest to record their third album and make it more of a hard rock style. The album that came from that, Love It to Death, became a big hit, riding the success of their first hit, I'm 18. The group followed up Love It to Death with their album, Killer. They also went out on tour, and soon the shows became really elaborate, but they made the band's reputation. They also, in a way, ended up breaking up the band because after Killer and three more albums, 1972's School's Out, 1973's Billion Dollar Babies, and Muscle of Love, and with hits like School's Out, No More Mr. Nice Guy, Elected, and Teenage Lament 74, combined with nonstop touring, the band needed a break. They just decided not to get back together after their break. Alice the Man, however, decided to keep going. He got a new backup band together, took the Alice Cooper band name as his own name, and recorded as a solo act. His solo career was extremely successful, with hits from the 70s through the 90s. Hits like Poison, Feed My Frankenstein, How You Gonna See Me Now, You and Me, Only Women Bleed, and many more. The rest of the guys did one album together, then did their own things. The band has gotten back together sporadically over the decades, but one person was always missing, unfortunately. Glenn Buxton, who sadly passed away from viral pneumonia in 1997. Presented for induction by Rob Zombie himself, the group 
Alice Cooper with Vincent Fernier, a.k.a. Alice Cooper, the late great Glenn Buxton, Dennis Dunaway, Michael Bruce, and Neil Smith, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2011. And we have put the group and Alice Cooper's solo, that is, all of their greatest hits on to this week's podcast playlist, the link to which, as always, is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony took place on October 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in Cleveland, Ohio, and was shown live on Disney+. Plus. The show started off with Dua Lipa singing Cher's hit song, Believe, and then, surprisingly, even though she said she would never show up, Cher showed up in the second verse of the song. I will simply say that one person sang completely off-key virtually the entire time, and no, it wasn't Cher. Zendaya then inducted Cher, and in accepting the award, Cher sang If I Could Turn Back Time. Cher's speech lasted about seven minutes and was actually pretty good. British club owner and entrepreneur Alexis Horner was up next for the Award for Musical Excellence. He was honored with a five-minute mini-documentary. Chuck D. then came out to induct Cool in the Gang and worked pretty much every single one of the group's hit song names into his induction speech. The group did a medley of Hollywood Swinging, Get Down On It, Ladies Night, Jungle Boogie, and ended with Celebration. Robert Cool Bell and James J.T. Taylor accepted the award. J.T. had the audience shine their cell phone lights to honor the other members of the band who were no longer alive, which, as it turns out, is pretty much every single other member, literally. There's only two left out of the entire group. That's kind of scary. Tiana Taylor was up next to induct Miss Dionne Warwick for the Award for Musical Excellence. There were a few Musical Excellence Awards given out that night. At one point during Tiana's speech, the audience wasn't shown enough love, at least according to Tiana, so she yelled at the audience to be louder. She also had the dreaded teleprompter issues, and she definitely let the world know all about that. One other thing about induction speeches that presenters tend to forget sometimes is that the focus should be on who you're presenting the award to, not on you. You don't need to do your damn act. Tiana broke that rule, which was very sad and extraordinarily annoying. Jennifer Hudson then sang Dion's song, I Know I'll Never Love This Way Again, with Dion coming out to sing with her. Dion then sang Walk On By and gave her speech. People rudely kept screaming at her to speak louder. That would soon become a theme throughout the night as audio issues plagued the entire evening. Tom Morello came out to induct MC5 for musical excellence. Tom Morello, by the way, can give one hell of a speech, and if I ever need to have a speech given, I'm calling Tom Morello. Seriously. Sammy Hagar gave a speech to induct Foreigner, but spent most of the speech complaining that it took too long for Foreigner to get into the hall to begin with. Legit point, I guess. By the way, did you know that there were no original members in the touring group Foreigner that goes out on tour these days? That was actually who was playing Foreigner's hits feels like the first time hot-blooded and I want to know what love is. Slash from Guns N' Roses and Chad Smith from the Red Hot Chili Peppers helped out with Demi Lovato, Kelly Clarkson, and Sammy Hagar trading off vocal duties. Lou Graham then surprisingly came out to finish off I Want to Know What Love Is with Kelly Clarkson. 
Mick Jones, unfortunately, could not make it. His daughter, actress Annabelle Dexter Jones, accepted on her his behalf. And judging by her reaction, my thought is that Mick's health may not be the greatest. And the way she was choking up when she was talking about him and how she misses her dad leads me to believe that he may not be long for the world, unfortunately. Great guy. Motown songwriter Norman Whitfield was inducted next for musical excellence. They just gave him a three-minute video montage and moved on. Unfortunately, the man deserved better. Roger Daltrey inducted Peter Frampton. Roger also forgot what year it was for a little while. May we all live long enough to forget what year it is on occasions. Keith Urban came out to jam with Peter on Do You Feel Like I Do? Brian Adams sent congratulations via video because he was performing. Blue's great Big Mama Thornton then received the three-minute video montage treatment for her Musical Influence Award. And then they moved on, and much like in life, Big Mama deserved better than that as well. Dave Matthews paid tribute to fellow inductee Jimmy Buffett by playing Buffett's song A Pirate Looks at 40. James Taylor then came out to give Buffett's induction speech and then played Buffett's song Come Monday with Kenny Chesney. Music executive Suzanne DePass received the Amit Erdogan Award. Barry Gordy sent congratulations via video. Blissfully, Suzanne was there to accept the award on stage. Dave Chappelle inducted A Tribe Called Quest, who gave some of the longest speeches of the night, which were mainly a bunch of word salads. There was also some extremely questionable use of the N-word thrown about as well. I... uh, Never mind. Anyway, when everyone was getting off the stage, the late Fife Dog's father decided that he wanted to speak, so he then grabbed the mic for a few more minutes. Then it was time to have an all-star tribute with The Roots, Common, De La Soul, Queen Latifah, and Busta Rhymes doing a medley of Tribe songs. Although Tribe was there, they could have actually have just done them as well, but whatever. Dr. Dre and Method Man then inducted Mary J. Blige, who performed My Life, Love No Limit, Be Happy, and Family Affair. Mary was also one of the few artists who thanked the fans and gave the best speech of the night, I thought. The In Memoriam section had so many people who had passed away that they had to show two people at a time in parts. They were pretty complete, though. I have to say, they actually managed to get even Liam Payne and Sissy Houston, who passed away very recently, into the mix. So kudos to them for doing the In Memoriam section properly. Jack Black came out and inducted Ozzy Osbourne, who then had an all-star tribute band playing Crazy Train, Mama, I'm Coming Home, and No More Tears. The father of British blues, John Mayo, received the video montage treatment for his Musical Influence Award. He might have been there to receive it, except that he passed away earlier in 2024. Not too long ago, actually. About, I think, three or four months Julia Roberts then inducted the Dave Matthews Band, who had the last induction of the evening. The Dave Matthews Band played Ants Marching, Crash Into Me, So Much to Say, and Too Much. Dave spoke for the band. Then they finished off the night by playing Burning Down the House from the Talking Heads in honor of the 40th anniversary of the influential concert film Stop Making Sense that the Talking Heads did. And then the show is over. Unfortunately, they no longer do that all-star jam at the end of the evening that they used to do. That's kind of a, that's really too bad. Actually, it was one of the highlights of the night. Overall, the music for the night was great, but the production was awful. There were drilling noises in the background when the first couple of acceptance speeches were going on. The teleprompter kept speeding up on some presenters, and the microphone issues were completely unprofessional with failing microphones constantly. I think the evening has also convinced me that some musicians just shouldn't give acceptance speeches because some of them made Donald Trump seem like a master orator compared to them. Then there's this thought. Sometimes watching older artists is a lot like watching a baseball old-timers game. 
Sure, it's great to see them, but it's tough when you remember them as younger guys. I think it kind of gives you a sense of your own mortality sometimes. For instance, to see old clips of Lou Graham back in the 70s when he was the lead singer of Foreigner, and then to watch him try to belt out I Want to Know What Love Is at the ceremony was kind of sad, especially when you know about his health issues. Same with watching Frampton, who has muscular disease, but at least he can still play and sing. He just can't jump around on stage like he used to. And then there were the guys who, as much as you love them, should probably just give up singing live, as they couldn't hit a proper note to save their lives. Billy Idol rapidly comes to mind, much as I love the guy. He couldn't hit a note. It was... Mm. Oh, well. Anyway... On to next year's induction ceremony. Here's hoping they get better production people next time. In America, the main lobby group for the recording industry and the one that gives out the Grammy Awards is the Recording Academy. Its Canadian equivalent is the Canadian Academy for the Recording Arts and Sciences. Their version of the Grammys are the Juno Awards. In 1978, the Canadian Academy started inducting groups into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. The Physical Hall was opened in 2016 as a part of the National Music Center on Level 5 of Studio Bell on 854th Street Southeast in Calgary, Alberta. The center is open Thursday to Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The price of admission is to pay what you can. And as with everything these days, check their website with updated hours of operation. Studiobell.ca is its website, and we will put that link in the show notes for you. Unlike the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which normally has six or more artists inducted, depending on various category committees, the Canadian Hall usually only inducts one group into its hall per year. In fact, it's actually only inducted more than one artist per year, about six or seven times since 1978. The Bare Naked Ladies started out as the duo of Ed Robertson and Stephen Page. The two went to school together and liked the same music. They even were camp counselors at the same music camp. They actually came up with their band name after becoming bored at a Bob Dylan concert. They winged their first gig together with no rehearsal time and just playing guitar and bantering back and forth. The duo continued honing their act, which became sort of a musical comedy routine with made-up lyrics to songs. They modeled their act after the Canadian comedy act Corky and the Juice Pigs. After meeting their comedic idols and handing them a demo tape, they were invited to be Corky's opening act. The band released their first non-indie album in 1991 called The Yellow Tapes, then went on tour in Canada to support it. The major labels rejected the album, but it still sold well at their shows. And then soon, word of mouth about their shows started to get around Canada, and they became a major touring draw. A controversial event that wasn't actually controversial was the thing that jump-started their career nationally. The band was kicked off of a New Year's Eve gig at Toronto's Town Hall because politicians thought that their band name objectified women. The band booked a gig elsewhere and moved on. The media, though, got wind of it and ran with the story, saying that it was political correctness gone way too far. To which, well, they were right. What all the controversy did, though, was to finally get them a recording contract with Sire Records. Their first album for the label, 1992's Gordon, had their classics Be My Yoko Ono and the song that's been in a bunch of TV commercials, If I Had a Million Dollars, I'd Be Rich. Their next couple of albums, Maybe You Should Drive and Born on a Pirate Ship, were moderately successful, but all of their success so far was in Canada. The album that broke through in America was 1998's album Stunt. That album had their smash hit one week along with their song It's All Been Done. 2000's album Maroon had the hit Pinch Me. And after that, the band went back to releasing independent records on their own record label. Then 
trouble struck. In 2008, Stephen Page was arrested for cocaine possession. In 2009, he was out of the band. It was said it was by mutual agreement. While the band's record sales have dropped, they still put out the occasional album. They're also a big draw on the nostalgia circuit, and they were actually one of the first bands to do nostalgia-themed cruises, which are, of course are now all the rage with groups like Journey doing them. The band was nominated for two Grammy Awards, winning neither of them, two Billboard Music Awards, winning both of those, and most importantly to this part of the podcast, 18 Juno Awards, winning eight of them. They've even been called one of the most important bands to Canadian culture this century. When the band were inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame, they were put in as the Bare Naked Ladies and Stephen Page, due to the fact that Stephen had been out of the band for almost a decade but still deserved recognition. After Rush's Getty Lee inducted the band, Stephen joined them on stage for his first performance with the band in a decade. And while there are no immediate plans for him to rejoin the band, there aren't any plans to rule him out either. The Bare Naked Ladies and Stephen Page, inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame in 2018, and we have put the band's greatest hits onto this week's podcast playlist as well. And like I said before, the link is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.